good morning. Uh, some of you have seen pictures I've posted of a cat last November. I don't remember the first time I saw it, this presumably wild cat in the sense of living out wild, rocked up at my house with a terrible injury on his head. Um, so he'd lost an ear and probably more than that part of his head as well. And um, I think remembering back to that time, I put some food out for him um, and he began to, needless to say, having been given food, that he began to return fairly regularly. And so I, when he did, I gave him food and milk, water. And he became um, a kind of a resident, never really coming into the house, but sleeping outside, no matter what the weather. Um, I mean, he, he wouldn't come in the house. I didn't particularly want him to, and nor did he. Uh, he did venture in once and shut out when he saw me. And he stayed basically. So he adopted me um, for a while at least. And his injury was so bad, there was clearly such a, a hole in his head um, where the ear had been that I decided to take him to bed. I had no idea if he did belong to anybody. It didn't seem as though he did because. He'd never been, looked like he'd never been treated for anything, you know, he was full of all sorts of things. And um, so I got him, I was quite nervous about finding a way to get him into a box, and he went crazy in his box. I suppose if you're used to freedom, you're not going to like being contained in one very small cat carrier and taken in the car for half an hour. And he made that <laughs> very, very clearly known. And anyway, um, the vet said, I'm not sure, you know, if he can survive an operation, I'm not sure if it's going to do, I'm not sure what it is. Anyway, she said, I will do my best. Interesting that when he came out of the carrier, he kind of opened up the wound even more. And I felt myself getting very tearful. I thought, well, you know, I, I don't tear up. I don't say I think it's a very valuable thing. I believe that tears are a blessing. But I don't tear up often. Um, and yet I did. And uh, that was quite interesting for me to notice that reaction I had to him. I feel it a bit now as I talk about it. And interesting to explore what that's about. Um, anyway, she said she'd do her best. And so then I picked him up the next day, just leave him here. We'll operate on him now. We'll pick him up the next day. And so I went back the next day and he had been stitched up and had a collar on, uh, quite a big collar to stop him from scratching. When she said, you'll have to keep him indoors and you have to keep the collar on and bring him back in two weeks time. And she said it very nicely. They were very caring in the vets. And um, well, you can imagine that that wasn't popular with him having this collar on. And when we got back, nor was it easy for him to eat. It was almost too big for him to be able to get his head to the ball. I managed somehow, and I don't know how I did this, to cut the collar back so it was shorter, so he could at least um, get to his food more easily. Um, but it was messy, and of course he couldn't wash his face, and that whole thing became very bloody. But nevertheless, it stayed on miraculously. And then just before, um, and I had managed to just about get him to let me stroke him. And then just before um, I was due to take him back to the vets to have the collar removed, the wound still wasn't looking great, to be honest. He disappeared. He just disappeared. He vanished and never normally strayed from my patio outside. He would sleep. It's undercover. He would sleep on you know, the chairs there. And he, and he didn't go very far from there at all. And he'd just gone. Um, and I was due at that time because I had been thinking how I'm going to how I'm going to manage this because I'm due to go to the UK for a week. Um, but I thought, well, he's managed before in the wild; he's survived, but not with a collar on. 
and I was really concerned, you know, I was going to come back and find this collar hanging on a branch with a skeleton in it, um, that he'd get stuck somewhere, because that was the uh, vet's advice. I mean, I, I had not been able to keep him indoors. It was absolutely impossible to keep him indoors. And given that he stayed on the patio, I decided that was okay. Anyway, now he'd vanished with this collar. And I thought, God, I looked everywhere for adverts and paper also to see if anybody knew the cat, if they knew the owner. And um, nothing. Anyway, I went to the UK, came back, was here for, here for a week or so. And then my neighbour, who knew that I'd had this cat, knew that I was looking for they came, the children of the neighbour came dashing down to mine and said, We've just seen you, we've just seen your cat. <laughs> my cat, not really, he's his own. He's, he's his own cat. Anyway, um, he was up a few uh, houses away. And um, there's no way. I mean, the house was, gates were locked anyway because the owner's had it as a second home. And I thought, well, there's, there's nothing I can do. I could see him and then he disappeared again. However, a little bit later, there'll be rocks at mine looking for where the poo usually is. But no collar. I mean, somehow he got rid of this collar. He was in a mess. His head was in a mess. His paws were in a mess. His tail was in a mess. Um, but he got the collar off. And I thought, well, you know, I'll leave it. I'll leave him without the collar. There's nothing I can really do about that. I didn't think it was a good idea to try and get him back to the vet. Just yet. I thought, see if, the, if it heals up on its own. Anyway, um, it sort of healed sometimes, but it didn't seem to be getting better overall. But he seemed generally quite content. You know, he would let me stroke him from time to time. Uh, he would pair with that. He'd settle on the, the seats outside. He'd make a kind of uh, look. Those neighbours' cats come round when the neighbours' cat did turn up, as if to kind of say, get rid of him. You know, he's, he's encroaching on my territory. Um, and I think he went off from time to time on the razzle. I'm sure there must be a female cat on heat somewhere. And he'd come back from that night out in a terrible state. And I, someone said, well, you know, often there's several tomcats get attracted to the female cats at that time and they fight with each other. And I thought that's what's probably doing it. That's what's opening up the wound again. Um, so I thought time to take him to the vet again. Oh, I knew he hated that box. So I borrowed a cage, like a dog cage, and I'd wired over all the big holes so that he couldn't get, so I thought he couldn't get through those. I finished up driving to the vet with him in this cage, which had got a lot more space, and he managed to get through one of these tiny holes. Now I'm now driving on the road where I couldn't easily stop with a French driver behind me waving at me to uh, speed up and a cat running wild in the car. Um, it's a miracle we both made it to the vet, to be honest. I think I probably needed more treatment than him by that time. <laughs> uh, if I had stopped, I think I'd have given that woman behind me what for. That was a great example of don't assume, you know, that I'm just a slow driver. You don't know what the situation is. Um, and I, I just thought, yeah, I'd love to be able to tell her in no uncertain terms what the situation was, that she was presumably making assumptions. I'm making assumptions about her too. And um, so he's in the, in the vet. Oh no, I, we couldn't get him out of the car. He buried himself somewhere in the car. So I had to drive back with him underneath my seat in the car. I thought he'd actually got somehow into the engine at one point. Get him back, get him in the cab carrier and back. Now this is now two trips to the vets, a couple of hours finally. Anyway, got him there. And then um, the vet later that day phoned me up and said we think it's um, a tumour and um, it's only going to get worse and it was getting worse um, she said if it was my cat I'd put him down it's your decision she said but he's got a hole in his head basically and you know I went through this inner dialogue but surely and he has been and surely if I said no you know you have to decide I trust the vet's decision um, you know I can make all these sort of excuses there for me I think rather than for him and I said just let me reflect on that I said how long do I need to reflect on this and she said 
take 10 minutes. And I thought, that's right, you know, I don't need more than that. I don't need to reflect till tomorrow. I'll only go around in circles. Um, I thought the vet handled that very well. And so I did reflect for 10 minutes and I phoned back and she knew by the tone of my voice. I said, I take your advice. And she said, okay. She said, I think it's, I think it's the right decision. I think she said something like that. <clears throat> so I came away. Now I went back to collect the cat carrier and uh, I go back to collect his ashes in a few weeks time. I don't know how you know whether you've got the actual cat's ashes or they just give you a bucket full. I never knew whether I got my mom's ashes when I was in Liverpool either, to be honest, it was in an open jug. Um, and I just felt very emotional. I mean, this cat had only been with me for three months. And I thought, what is it about this cat that's touched my emotions so much? And I've reflected on that a lot. And I think the key things were that this is a cat who'd survived, you know, he'd survived being in the wild through some pretty tough weather um, with a bad injury. And even with that injury, I suspect he still went off on the razzle <laughs> and found a way to uh, have a good time, so to speak. Um, and he would open himself to a little amount of affection. And he had a great appetite. <laughs> and he knew what he liked. Um, the other cats in the region got to know what was being served up here as well, like chicken and fish from time to time. It's the gourmet cat restaurant. So we started to attract a few customers. And I thought, you know, those are qualities that I just think, wow, you know, there's, there's humans that wouldn't cope in the way that he would sometimes if he scratched and he caught his ear, he would kind of howl for a moment because it was presumably then so painful. And I thought, wow, what resilience. Um, and also reflected on the fact that, you know, one minute he was this cheeky cat and the next minute he was dust. And I thought that's a reminder. Enjoy life, whatever the situation, have a good time and deal with what you've got. It is what it is. Bizarrely, I realize mm, I can be on the rebound with this. Bizarrely, there was an advert in the paper, somebody saying that they'd found a wild cat, not mine. He was definitely, he had been definitely put down. Um, they'd found a wild cat that been, they think had been surviving you know, in the wild for some time that was very cautiously affectionate, um, not injured, um, but they were looking, they had cats of their own and they were looking for somebody to give this cat a good home. Mm. Dilemma. And I realised because some people said, would you get another cat? And I thought, no, I wouldn't because I'm not interested in just getting a, a regular cat. It was the fact that it was such a tough little character that had coped, that had survived. And that maybe, you know, he had a sort of bit of luxury living before he uh, moved on. There we are. That's the story. I called him Big Ears. I'm not sure. That's on his, that's on his death certificate, Big Ears, only because it, it just seemed kind of, I don't know why I found myself calling that, even though he only had one ear. Anyway, rest in peace, big ears. <laughs>